Welcome to Conversatio, the Belmont Abbey College podcast. This podcast aims to form and transform our community so that each of us can reflect God's image. I'm Dr. Mary Imperato, Chair and Assistant Professor of Politics at Belmont Abbey College. I'm your host for today's episode, and joining me is Dr. Bronwyn McShay. She's a historian and author of Apostles of Empire, La Duchesse, and the forthcoming Women of the Church, which will be out from Ignatius Press next month. She teaches church history at the Augustine Institute and holds an MTS from Harvard and a PhD in history from Yale. She specializes in early modern European history and particularly the history of Christianity in this period. Bronwyn, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. And congrats um, for your recent books, La Duchesse, which was just out, published um, with an imprint of Simon & Schuster, actually, so sort of a popular history. Well, Pegasus books, Pegasus. who were with Simon & Schuster, yes. And, yes. and then you have the upcoming uh, Women of the Church. So. Mm-hmm really great there. And we're so thrilled to have Dr. McShay here on campus today to actually give a talk, to give the spring lecture for the Thomas More program. Um, and real quick, a plug for Thomas More, the Thomas More Scholarship Program. I'm the assistant director of the program. He gives a scholarship to our students. Every spring, they take a seminar together where they study the Western tradition, what, from the Greeks all the way up to the modern period. Um, we have lectures, one in the fall, one in the spring. And we have social events. We go on hikes. We go to outings at museums, and it's a great program. So if you have any um, high schoolers in your life, please urge them to apply for the Thomas More Scholarship Program. Um, But back to our topic here, um, talking to Dr. McShay and giving us kind of a preview a little bit of her talk tonight, which is gonna be titled, When Church and State Were United, The Role of Powerful Lay Women in Historical Catholic Regimes. Um, And it seems that your focus on early modern Europe has been exploring this intermingling of church and state Mm -hmm. Um, your first book, Apostles of Empire, which came out... 2019. 2019. Yeah. I have it here to demonstrate. Um, we do have a copy of it. And so this yeah. So this book was about the Jesuit missionaries in New France. Um, and tell us a little bit about this first book project of yours and how it sort of launched you into your further studies. Yeah, so uh, Apostles of Empire grew out of my... Uh, the Jesuits in New France. It, it uh, was with Nebraska Press. I should plug the press. Um, it grew out of my Yale dissertation. Um, and it, it's a study of the French Jesuit mission to North America in the 17th and 18th centuries, the mission famous for some of its Jesuit martyrs like mm-hmm. Isaac Jogues, Jean de Brebeuf. Um, I was interested in ways that the Jesuits themselves saw some of their work as um, supportive of French colonial expansion. Mm. For example, through uh, trade and military partnerships with Native American groups like the Hurons and the Iroquois. And they saw uh, the, the program of converting new populations to Catholicism as part of the building of the French Empire. Hmm. And so there, there, there's a historiography that was very separate. Like the missionaries were treated as kind of these religious fanatics who had no interest in more secular matters mm-hmm. uh, in some of the historiography. Um, or there was a focus on the, the missionaries' very good uh, attention to ways in which they were advancing Christianity and, and sort of trying to adapt it to Native American context, but mm-hmm. there was just very little attention to their, who's supporting them in France, how closely tied they were to imperial elites in Paris. And mm-hmm. so I basically wanted to tell the story of the mission kind of from a bird's eye view, the entire mission over two centuries. And mm-hmm. um, along the way, I discovered uh, some of the powerful French elites who backed the mission, gave it money, supported mm-hmm. it in political ways. And I kind of stumbled into the story of uh, this woman, Marie de Vigneron, the niece of Cardinal Richelieu, um, who was very supportive of French missions overseas. And that kind of led to my second book project, which we'll talk about. Um, so it kind of, it, it sort of led to an unexpected new project. So she was this really fascinating figure that you knew of as the niece of the great Cardinal Richelieu, this sort of mm-hmm. Machiavellian figure, you know, raison de tad, this bad guy, mm-hmm. right? Um, so. For those of us who are sort of maybe history neophytes, mm-hmm. could you kind of set the stage a little bit for who she is, who's Richelieu, what's he doing in, in 17th century France? Sure. What's happening in France at this time, what's happening in the church at this time, um, that, that her world? Sure. So um, the Duchess of Aiguillon, that's her title, but her name was Marie de Vigneron. She lived from 1604 to 1675. And so she was born shortly after France had been torn apart by religious wars Mm. between Protestants and Catholics. The kingdom was recovering from that. Um, There was a growing kind of rift in the, among the political elites about um, having either strong support for the Habsburgs, the Spanish and the Holy Roman Empire, Mm -hmm. 
um, and the Catholic cause broadly in Europe in a political sense. And then there were other elites in the government who favored uh, kind of a new growing idea of French national interests that was still very much Catholic, but had room to kind of incorporate Protestant nobles and others mm -hmm. and to focus on maybe expanding French power, commerce, trade overseas um, and, and co like colonialism as well. It, it, eventually that happened. And Cardinal Richelieu was a prime minister for um, the queen regent of France, um, who the mother of Louis XIII, who's the king. And then as Louis XIII became uh, mature and took power, Richelieu remained his, his leading advisor, eventually sort of has full power of, uh, um, in the French state. And mm. he's a Catholic cardinal. Mm -hmm. He very much favored the reform of the Catholic Church according to the Council of Trent of the previous century. But he was very, very political and he had great ambitions for France. And he, he mm -hmm. was very much on the side of this kind of anti-Habsburg, pro-French uh, power in Europe party. Mm. Uh, called Le Bon François, the good French, uh, mm -hmm. versus the, de, the Les Devotes, the, the devout party. And so um, mm. his niece was born into this situation and she kind of in some ways helped his rise to power as a lady in waiting and in various other ways that I get into in the book. So I'm not I'm not sure if that gets into the context. Yeah, enough, no, that's, but, that's fantastic. Okay. So yeah. um, she's his heiress, right? Mm -hmm. And she was kind of an advisor to him and this kind some of... Ways. Mm -hmm. Her relationship with him gave her like access to avenues of power that she would not have really had. Yes. So Richelieu uh, had several siblings. His older sister was her mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, his niece, young women in that era, the way they were supposed to help their families was to marry someone wealthy and powerful and to kind of expand the family through marriage and having mm -hmm. children that would then inherit, the male uh, relatives would inherit the titles and the property. She was married, but she was widowed very young. and She would not remarry for various reasons, I explain in the book. Um, she had a brother who was supposed to be the, the heir of Richelieu, Francois. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to become the Duc de Richelieu, um, get all the power and wealth, and be maybe his leading, most trusted confidant. But Francois was kind of a disaster. He, oh, he just gambled a lot, <laughs> spent money. And Marie, this young woman, she was very devout Catholic. She was very... Um, Kind of sensitive, very into uh, the arts and literature and culture. Mm -hmm. She considered becoming a nun at one point. <clears throat> she sort of had a knack for politics and life at court, and she ends up kind of blossoming into the, one of the greatest social hostesses in Paris. She becomes almost like a first lady figure to this celibate cardinal who has no wife. Mm -hmm. um, as his his ward, her father died, and so he kind of raises her in her like. Um, uh, her early 20s, basically, he becomes almost like a father figure to her and she joins his household and also is a lady in waiting mm -hmm. at court, um, one of the highest ranking ladies in waiting. So she had a lot of she helped kind of staff the queen's court with Richelieu loyalists and she herself mm. was very much a Richelieu loyalist. And um, so I, I'm getting caught up in some of the details over to like she advised him on things as uh, of the nature of like choosing who got to be a bishop in France. Who, oh, wow. um which projects would get sort of state funding for various things, including charitable hospitals and things like that. So she, I get into plenty of detail uh -huh. like that in the book. Who um, are some of her contemporaries that our audience might have heard of that she kind of she's running in circles with in this mm -hmm. kind of, I guess, post Counter Reformation era France, mm -hmm. you might say, right? Like who is yes. she running well, in she, circles with? She became very good friends with Saint Vincent de Paul, one of the most famous Catholic saints. She mm -hmm. was one of his major patrons mm -hmm. uh, of some of his charitable projects, his missions to the poor. Um, she knew a very young Blaise Pascal, the mathematician and writer, mm -hmm. and his siblings, uh, his sisters, one of whom was a poet. Um, she actually knew Rene Descartes. Oh, wow. There's some indication <laughs> she might have supported one of his earlier publications, but I couldn't find um, mm -hmm. records about that. Um, I mean, she knew the royal family. Mm -hmm. She knew young Louis XIV when he was a little toddler, would kind of run about <laughs> her grounds on her chateau. And uh -huh. um, I, he actually, as he became a teenager, became jealous of her chateau de Roy, west of Paris. And mm -hmm. he, he tried to buy it from her when he was king. <laughs> and she said no. She's one of the only nobles who could say no to King Louis XIV, oh, okay. the son king. <laughs> um, there's others, too, that uh, I'm, mm. I, I'm, yes, there's a vast cast of characters in the book, including some famous people um, like uh, that I'm... You know, yeah, Moliere is, uh, appears later on in the oh, book wow. and some other, many other people. Anyway. One of the things that may be striking to the audience and to me as well is that they're like 
a Cardinal Richard the way and she herself, like they're bouncing back and forth from like church affairs to affairs mm -hmm. of state mm -hmm. as if there's no separation there. Like it's just, it's such a spectrum of things they right. gotta be concerned about. Right, they had a strong sense of the distinction, like distinct, distinct spheres and distinct, like when Richelieu uh, led, like he had to go to war zones a lot as the king's leading advisor. And when mm -hmm. he went like to La Rochelle, there's a great battle with, with Protestants actually, La Rochelle, a mm -hmm. famous uh, siege of La Rochelle. Um, there's a famous painting of him, painted in the 19th century, showing him in his flowing cardinal robes while reviewing troops. Oh, wow. That would never have happened. When he went to battle zones, he dressed mm -hmm. like a nobleman military officer. Oh. He had he had a clear sense of his secular duties versus his duties as a bishop, then cardinal. Mm -hmm. But there was, he had a strong sense, and she later shared this after he died and left his vast fortune to her mm -hmm. and a lot of other power. He and his niece believed that sometimes churchmen made much more loyal political people because they were motivated less by family interest. Um, they didn't have, ideally, if they were good clergymen, <laughs> they did not have children mm -hmm. they could leave their fortunes to or their titles. And so they, mm -hmm. he had a belief they could be motivated by public spirit. And so oh, sometimes okay. made good um, diplomats, statesmen in certain cases. And mm -hmm. um, so, and this was a time when part of the political scene was that France was being also torn apart, there was a civil war called the Fronde after Richelieu's time, but mm -hmm. the Duchess of Aguillon was very much involved at the center of things. Mm -hmm. um, some of the leading old noble families really resented the growing power of the monarchical state and the kind of growing class of bureaucratic officials who came from the mm -hmm. lower orders of society, kind of men of talent who were loyal to the, the state or the prime minister more than they were loyal to kind of traditional feudal noble lords. Mm. And so there's a um, there's tension over that going on. And so mm. there was a great distrust of some of the leading families of France, like the Condé family. Ironically, mm. Richelieu was very jealous of the power of the Richelieu family. And he knew that he could trust his niece to kind uh -huh. of safeguard the family's interest over time. That's one reason he bequeathed so much to her. Wow. Um, in the hope of preserving the Richelieu family name. So there's a lot of interesting contradictions and tensions there. But Sort of interesting way of telling this story because um, so often you hear about the intertwining of church and state as something that's poisonous and very bad for a state. And it seems like there's a way in which they can enrich each other mutually. And like, so you're saying how churchmen could make good diplomats. And in the book, you get into the way that lay people can actually make good reformers of the church. Sometimes, and, yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, why don't you share some stories about, you know, Marie here on the the yeah. front lines of reforming the church yeah, after I mean, the there, Reformation. There's, all, there's many examples. Um, a, a key example, there's a famous church in Paris, uh, Saint-Sulpice, it's a beautiful church. Um, it was her parish church in, in Paris. It was, when she was younger, it was in the middle of the most like den of iniquity neighborhood in all of <laughs> Paris with, with, you know, like brothels and you know, gin shops and mm -hmm. just people like fights breaking out of the street all the time. There was a bit of an elite enclave of houses like hers, mansions uh, mm -hmm. close by. That's why it was her parish church. Most elites in the neighborhood, if they live close by, would just go to mass elsewhere and stay away from the riffraff. Mm -hmm. She in the book you said the Sorbonne is located there, uh, uh, so like close to there. Yeah, okay. it's, so you have like yeah. some university students going uh, like, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, probably <laughs> doing things they shouldn't have done, right. but. Um, <laughs> but um, meeting people they shouldn't have been meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, so she actually took a strong interest in saint Sulpice, mm. and she helped install a new pastor there, Jean-Jacques Ollier, who's not a canonized saint, but there's some interest that he should be, uh, there has been over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically just cleaned house in this parish. It, it took a long time. I mean, she endowed like um, uh, bened benediction services, like Eucharistic, uh, mm. services, um, like the preaching just got so strong. Crowds started coming to this church and kind of like little cells of kind of holiness and virtue coming out of some of these parishes mm -hmm. uh, helped reform some neighborhoods. So that's one example. But she also, I should say, actually, there were violence broke out. Like when you went, tried to reform a parish like that, mm -hmm. like the, um, one of the, the priests she installed there got dragged out of his rectory into the streets and was beaten up. Oof. And when she heard about this, she was out at her country estate when this happened. She came right back to Paris. Uh -huh. She got sort of the law involved and there was never another incident like that again, like high wow. security, like she made sure there was high security at this church. But yeah. she also, um, 
That makes sense of what yeah. you said. In the book, you talked about St. Vincent de Paul didn't even want to go there to preach a mission, like a one-day mission. Exactly. He was like, it's, there's so much refer after that. Like, even the same. Even St. Like, Vincent de Paul, who loved being around like the most impoverished, down-and-out people, like yeah. did not want to <laughs> preach there. So, yeah. Um, Bad scene. But also another way that, so in this era, this is, this was generally the case throughout Christian Europe um, for centuries, actually. Uh, High-level noble families, especially people close to the crown, mm -hmm. um, actually had the ability to help select who became bishops. Sometimes this led to very corrupt decisions. Mm -hmm. You'd have, you know, corrupt men. And at the time of the Protestant Reformation, there were plenty of, of examples of corrupt churchmen um, who were doing all sorts of things that they should not have been. And um, France was still recovering from some of the corruption of that era. Um, but the Duchess of Aiguillon was among a number of devout Catholic nobles with a lot of power, a lot of clout with the crown. She would vet candidates to become bishops, to mm -hmm. become missionary bishops overseas, or in some cases, bishops in France, or maybe pastors of important parishes. Mm -hmm. And she very much could affect whether kind of someone very serious about his priestly vocation or his role as a bishop or his mm -hmm. commitment to various causes was chosen versus someone who was primarily motivated by loyalty to a patron. Mm -hmm. And so she, the patronage system could be worked, uh, could, could go to good ends or bad ends. And she very much spent her whole life trying to make it work for good ends, I think, for, for the church. And Did she face any pushback causes she believed like, as a laywoman? Especially um, as a woman, like maybe there's a role for yes, lady, but like not about this in particular. And the fact that that was not a cause of much controversy kind of shows you how much room there was in this time. Surprisingly mm -hmm. for us, we don't mm -hmm. assume that. What she did get pushback for was her closeness to Richelieu, because he was a mm -hmm. very political figure, and um, so she was sometimes presumed to be more corrupt or scandalous than mm -hmm. I found evidence that she was. And there was a vicious popular press and she got she because she'd never remarried after she was widowed at 18 mm -hmm. there were always stories going around like mm. if, if you decide to remain a single woman and not become a nun your whole life there's going to be whispers about you and mm -hmm. so they were she faced some terrible rumors about the true nature of her relationship with her uncle like kind of awful mm. awful uh, suggestions about that mm -hmm. there were i found no evidence, I'm not that there would be hard evidence of this, but um, the people who I did find out who was behind some of the worst of this, uh, these accusations in public. Mm -hmm. And it was almost always someone with a very particular grievance against Richelieu or the mm -hmm. government, like shortly after they had that grievance. So there, there seemed to be kind of strong political motivations. So mm -hmm. she faced a lot of kind of public, um, there were very mixed opinions about her in public. And she she was almost like a celebrity in her era. Like people knew who she was if mm -hmm. she was going down the street in her carriage. Uh -huh. And so she had to deal with that. But her, her she, actually, she was praised by the Pope for what she did oh, wow. with missions and support of various institutions, hospitals, schools. Uh, she had almost like an empire of charitable institutions. Oh, wow. And, and Pope Alexander VII praised her in very strong terms. So was she sort of a a one-off because it seems like you go at then from this book and you write women of the church and so it's sort of me may, maybe you were thinking like is she like a unicorn or well is this something that happens in early modern europe i think later? there were i suspect i mean i couldn't find anyone quite like her in the french scene who was not maybe a member of the royal family mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean there aren't other such women that, that what's striking to me was how the mountains of evidence I found for how important she was in so many sectors that she was sort of written out of history a little bit. Mm. Um, and so some of the older narratives don't really have room for someone like her. And yet mm -hmm. when, when you're looking at all the historical evidence and then you look at 17th century sources and they had plenty of room for it, they understood. Mm -hmm. So it's, it happened like 18th, 19th century is when she got sort of written out. Mm. Um, so they're, they're, I suspect there are others in the French scene, maybe if not right when she lived in the century before. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly figures like her, I think in the Spanish and Habsburg lands that have not mm -hmm. been, their stories haven't been told fully or properly, or mm -hmm. there might be kind of myths about them. Um, and many other contexts, I suspect. So the, the field of kind of 
bringing out the stories of of women in, in ways that were not done in the past is kind mm-hmm. of still growing. Like mm-hmm. there's a lot of new work happening. I, but in some ways she was a unicorn. Like she, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that every woman from an aristocratic family could have become someone like the Duchess of Aguillon because her relationship to Richelieu was so primary mm-hmm. and he was such a unique figure in French history. So um, nevertheless, it kind of opened my eyes more to the subject of like rethinking the role of lay women in particular in the mm-hmm. history of the church. And there are plenty of known stories. They're just not widely talked about. And um, I get into some of those in my book, Women of the Church. I was asked to teach a course at the Augustine Institute about the history of women in the church, yeah, okay. partly because I was working on this book about the Duchess. Mm-hmm. And so I got into the subject, the the broad subject of women in, in Catholic history, partly because of a teaching assignment that I mm-hmm. was happy to take on. Mm-hmm. And once I wrote the lectures for that course, I was like, gee, this could be, mm-hmm. uh, this might make for an interesting project. And so I, I was invited to write a book about it for a series, uh, the What Every Catholic Should Know series that the okay. Augustine Institute co-publishes with Ignatius. So um, yeah, that book uh, covers I actually counted mm-hmm. 365 different women or groups of women. Oh, wow. Sometimes just very much in passing. Uh-huh. Um, Not for each day. So when somebody asked me, <laughs> oh, did you cover, you know, Saint, it'll give me some obscure name, Saint, like Odile or whatever, the, like, some name. And I, I say, no, but I did cover, you know, 365 other people. <laughs> so Because there's plenty, I mean, there's so many remarkable women in the church's history. You can't cover all of them, especially mm-hmm. when you have page limitations. But um yeah, it was an exciting project. So, and, and the Duchess appears in there, but she she just gets two paragraphs in there. Oh, okay. So, anybody else? Could you give us a sample of who's some other maybe surprising well, figure or somebody interesting? Especially okay. surprising figure. She was not necessarily saintly though. Um, mm-hmm. it was Irene of Athens? She was a Byzantine empress. I didn't know before I was doing research for this book that among the Byzantine emperors who called together councils of the church was a woman, hmm. Empress Irene of Athens called together the second council of Nicaea that, oh. that in the um, 700s that mm-hmm. sort of ended the iconoclasm controversy. I'd never heard of this. And it shows the power that the emperors of the Byzantine emperor had and mm-hmm. a woman serving in the role of emperor could have. Th- but there are many other, I mean, there's many saints like St. Hildegard of Bingen, mm-hmm. Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, um, Teresa of Lisieux, many well-known figures I go on at length about in mm-hmm. sometimes new ways, sort of putting them in the context of their times, like not just focusing on their life kind of in a vacuum, but I kind of tell the whole history of the church through the eyes of women, saints, blesseds, venerables, some women who are not that saintly, mm-hmm. but who are important. So, um, yeah, and it, it, anyway, so. You know, when I first heard about this book project, immediately I thought, well, women saints of the church. Yes. You know, the, the standards, like you mm-hmm. talked about, Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, and I really like that you've got, like, we're, women of the church is like saints and sinners, and you've got the whole panoply in and there. And in some cases, women who could be canonized at some point, and they mm-hmm. are, I think, important historically. Like the, uh, there were uh, nuns martyred during the French Revolution. Mm. The, the Carmelite martyrs of Compiègne. Yeah. There were, uh, um, also other nuns, um, uh, uh, daughters of, of charity, um, and others who were martyred during the French Revolution, they are beloved figures in French Catholicism. Mm-hmm. They're still not canonized. They're supposed to be canonized soon, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, I just think, I, I think working on the Duchess of Aguillon's story, mm-hmm. and she's a figure I think every Catholic should know about, even though she's not canonized, mm-hmm. opened my eyes to this other realm you know, but there's also many, many saints that I think Catholics should know too, and yeah. they make their appearance in the book. Well, you know, we talked so. about the Duchess a lot, but uh, would you think she should be canonized? You know, having you looked know, at so closely, uh, you live with uh, Marie here. Yes, yes, you live with her for a few I years. Mean, uh, <laughs> the cover design of the book, I was very happy with Pegasus uh-huh. Books did a great, great job. Um, so, so is she but, a saint? Um, is this a, is this well, a saint's icon here? <laughs> I, you know, I actually try to be very strict about the hat that I wear. I'm a historian, mm-hmm. and my job is to marshal facts, present them. As as I see the story happening. And I think there were certainly ways in which she was very saintly compared to other people in her milieu. She was in mm-hmm. this very, very worldly power politics place and managed to maintain a tremendous amount of integrity. Mm-hmm. So I think there are, there's a case to be made, but it's not a case I'm supposed to make as an historian. Mm-hmm. You know, because I there were times in which she was quite ruthless. She was very much her uncle's niece. Mm-hmm. Um, 
she was definitely not perfect and she did not think of herself as perfect. Like she wanted on her tombstone, a simple ep uh, um, epigraph, is that what it's called? Yes, where it's called, like she said, here lies Marie de Vignero, a sinner. Hmm. And she didn't want much of anything else on there. But and they, that's what they put on there. No, they put this, <laughs> you're like the great grand <laughs> duchess, blah, 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 okay. like all this very dramatic description, mm -hmm. um, kind of like slightly against her wishes. But, um, <laughs> So she had, uh, I think her, her spirituality, she very much saw herself as a sinner who had to do reparation for others and for herself and for her family. Hmm. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I, to get someone canonized, a cause needs to be opened. Yeah. And there has never been a cause opened for her. Mm -hmm. And it would have to be opened in the archdiocese of, of Paris, actually, because that's her home archdiocese. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping some French people, if they have an interest in mm -hmm. that, that they at least read the story in France. And if some people think she deserves this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pose it. But it's not my role mm -hmm. as a historian to, to push that. So I know the book has been well received. Um, mm -hmm. Have you had like a French audience at all? Well, the like? book was, uh, <laughs> I, I have friends in France and I got photos from uh, Galignani, one of the top English language bookstores in Paris. It's near the Louvre. It mm -hmm. was on like their display table. Mm -hmm. um, so it's certainly selling in France mm -hmm. here and there, but in English, it's not translated into French yet. So I'm hoping there will be a translation, but that's not uh, determined yet. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I have, I have friends in France who, who, France who very much like the book and tell all their friends about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that must be an interesting experience to be French and to have an American telling yes. them, a, a, returning to them a piece of their history that maybe you said, you know, 18th, 19th century, kind of got lost. There was some things going on in France at the time, and I think maybe had to do with her being covered up in history. Possibly, <laughs> yes. I mean, she was, yes, part of an old noble family, yeah. devout Catholic, and the, the revolutionary era they, didn't, era, they didn't like her. And I'm, not only am I an American, I'm one with a very Irish name, Nick Shea, so, right. but, um, no, they, all the French people, I got tremendous welcome at several important, in several French uh, institutions. Um, her home in Paris was the, is the current residence, uh, uh, excuse me, it's where the offices of the president of the French Senate are based. Oh, okay. And it's close to the public. It's the Petit Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. And some French friends of mine arranged for me to have contact with a French senator. And I got a private welcome into the the Petty Luxembourg, because I was working on her story. That must have been so exciting to be in her home. <laughs> and then I didn't even yeah. ask for it. I also got a tour of the Luxembourg Palace, the, the Senate chambers, mm. like a private tour. At that building was one of the pal was the palace where she was a uh, lady in waiting. So I got to see some wow. of the areas where some of the intrigue might have occurred. And um, I got to look out of windows that she would have looked at. Like mm -hmm. it was just really, really interesting. And I also got a private tour of the Sorbonne Chapel where Richelieu's tomb is. Oh, wow. And so I, I have found the, the French that have learned about this and learned about me, they are very, very welcoming. And mm -hmm. I hope that will happen even more so if the book gets translated into French. Yeah, I hope this so, podcast makes its way across the ocean. That would be great. <laughs> a French person is watching this. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. It, this is really My fascinating. Um, as you conclude, as we conclude, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. And thank you so much, Dr. McShay for taking the time to join us on this episode and for this wonderful conversation. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe and tell your friends that Conversatio is available on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. Until next time, God bless. Mm -hmm.